I mean, listen, I don't know what else to say. Florian Shartner's here. I mean, Barry. Oh, forget it. I know. He's here. He's on the line. He's actually in Squadcast. I could see him. He's right there. Right, Barry? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, let's. we got to get this started. Maybe Florian will grunt with us. Ah! <laughs> Ow, I missed. <laughs> oh, jeez. I mistimed the grunt again. All right. Well, welcome, everybody, <laughs> to the Podcast Engineering Show. My name is Chris Curran. I produce podcasts for medium and large companies. And I also run Podcast Engineering School, which teaches uh, podcasters and podcast producers how to produce really good audio. And I have a background in audio engineering in the music business, starting in the, geez, in the 90s, a bunch of album credits and all that cool stuff. And I've been in podcasting for almost 10 years now, or maybe nine years. And um, I don't know, I've noticed a huge lack of audio skills in the podcasting space in terms of podcasters and and editors and stuff. So that's how this show can help because we really go deep into the technical aspects of podcast production and how to produce audio that sounds really good. And if you implement the best of what you learn here, your podcast will sound a lot better and you'll spend less time producing them. It's it it people love it. I don't know. Uh, the next podcast engineering school uh, program starts on April twenty eighth. By the way, so Florian Schartner's here. He's a German podcast producer based in Barcelona. So now, uh, Florian, I'm really happy you're here because now when I do the when I go finally go to Europe, I'm gonna actually meet with all the past guests of this show in Europe. So I want to come to Barcelona. Yeah, looking forward to. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, you're um you you're a podcast producer and you have uh most of your clients are speakers and coaches and companies and uh companies. mostly German speaking. Yes. And um you work with them on all facets of of the podcast, meaning from concept to production to distribution and marketing and uh you you also have a little background in the music business as well, making music. Yes. So um and and so how long have you actually been a full-time podcast producer? Like really full-time, full-time? Um, yeah, like August 2019, I quit my day job uh, because I couldn't handle it anymore because of the client amount that I had. And uh, so it was a good time to to quit the job. It was summer, I went on vacation, and I started 100% in September 2019. That's but I had been doing it for, for like three years. So as that a side is gig, yeah. That's awesome. That's like that's the, that's the success story right there. You know, you started doing it sort of on the side, uh, and then it became your full time thing. I mean, that's what a lot of podcast editors and producers want to do, right? They don't they don't want to go to their day job anymore. <laughs> that was my motivation as well. So it's much more satisfying for me now to work from my place and and dealing with the clients directly and giving them the results that they want without any further hassles or communication with an executive or manager. Nice. And your website, as I'll have it in the show notes, it's florian-shartner.com, and it's... Uh, it's in German. And, and yeah, Cr Chrome asked me, hey, do you want to translate this from oh, German? Cool, yeah. <laughs> Nine! Nine, <laughs> That's bitte. like one of the only... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's one of the only German words I know. Yeah. What else do I know, German? Uh, goulash? No. No. Yeah, yeah, it's a goulash. It's a dish, yeah. Schnitzel. Yeah, goulash is because my grandma and my mom used to make goulash, and my grandma was German, yeah. Cool. There you go. All right, goulash. When I come to Barcelona, we'll get some goulash, okay? <laughs> oh, we get some... <laughs> All right. We get some Spanish food, yeah. Pie and stuff. <laughs> All right, so let's do the speed round, which is where we want to hear from you, Florian, just literally in a minute or so. Quickly walk us through your signal chain of your microphone. Oh, but I forgot to ask. Do you actually personally host any podcast shows? I have a couple episodes produced, but I really want to have like 10 or 20 finished before I want to go public. Okay. So Which you're... is kind of complicated because of the workload. Uh, so, But I really want to... The people ask me all the time, so you're a podcast producer and you help companies. Do you have a podcast? And no, at this time it's... Uh. And they are like, oh... Right. Okay, you should do one. Yeah. Yeah, but that's interesting. So, and but you know, when we connected here, we're using Squadcast today, and we're actually showing. Well, we're 
We have the video up and running. Normally, when I use Squadcast, I just I'm like, let's turn off the video because actually, Florian, I'm I'm I actually have my notes on the screen, so I'm not even looking at the video this whole That's time. That's fine. I see <laughs> you. Yeah. But but anyway, Squadcast is, has been working really well for me lately, and um and so when we connected on Squadcast, I saw that you had uh you know a, a good mic and you had it plugged into some good equipment. So um yeah. Anyway, could be, and, and I bring that up because some podcast editors or producers, they they do not host their own show and they do not even have a decent microphone or a decent interface. They just literally like have a laptop where they, you know, open their DAW, do some editing and production and then, you know, send the audio back to the client or something. Yeah, totally. So, but I'm an audio nerd, so I love gear and stuff and I spend a significant amount of money in gadgets that I... <laughs> barely use and then I resell them, but I love just the feeling of new gear in my studio. So, yeah. How about, um, cause I, I have a, uh, um, I have a serious plug-in problem. Do you have a, <laughs> <laughs> just, yeah. Oh, well, I like purchasing plugins. You mean, so yeah. I have, yeah. Subscription based on almost anything. So oh. yeah, uh, the major ones I have, I own them all, so right oh. now it's nothing fancy. <laughs> all right, we're going to get into suggest. that. Yeah. Let's do the speed round. Take us through your signal chain. And like I said, from your mic to your channel strip to your interface, all the way to the computer, like what what do you, what apps do you record in? And then uh -huh. where do you do your editing? What, what applications? And then all the way until the final MP3. Just real quick, and then we'll pick it apart. Okay, so I have a Shure SM7B, which is like, I think the standard, it runs into a fat head, uh, which amplifies the mic gain. Then if I do live streaming, I use the DBX to 86S um, when I do live streaming. Now it's plugged in right away in the interface. I have a Universal Audio Polo Twin. If I go fancy, I have also the SSL Tiny Desk, the... Um, What's called the six SSL six? Really? Which is yeah, it's a cool thing. Um, I have it always cow. covered because it's covering a lot of dust, but it's a really, really fantastic thing <laughs> to use, and it looks nice on the table if yeah. people come into the studio. <laughs> then it runs into I record all my stuff and edit all the stuff in Studio One, and uh, basically n n no plugins on the input, so I don't I record it all dirty right into the door, and. When it comes to the audio cleaning, so there's always a little background noise or hiss or stuff. So I use the uh, Isotope RX7 advanced stuff a lot. So it is um, DD noise, like the standard one, which has without capturing the noise profile. Mm -hmm. If there's a significant amount of noise, I would use the feature with the noise capturing profile. Otherwise, the standard one is mm -hmm. totally fine. Got it. I use the mouth D click a lot when people do enough <laughs> lip smacking. Mm -hmm. and then I'm a big fan I consider myself like a little bit lazy when it comes to like to, to do the DSing stuff or whatever so I use Soothe 2 from Uke Sound oh Soothe 2 oh it's one it's, of my favorites it's on, it's on autopilot yeah and <clears throat> uh, Sonobla Audio Smart EQ and Smart Compressor which is really cool so you choose a, a voice profile and analyze and it creates an EQ curve Oh, we're going to talk about that. Wow. Okay. 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 So keep going. And then the smart comp. <clears throat> if I need a little bit more compression, I use the uh, Brainworks VSC2 compressor a lot. And then I use just the Pro L2 Fab filter limiter, minus 14, minus 16 loves. And uh, I may apply just a regular wave standard DS at the end at 16K. And that's okay. it. And then you mix it out of Studio One into yeah. and what what sort of um, MP3? I assume I do a three twenty kps MP3. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. For your clients, right? For your clients, yeah. I'm, so I don't use Libsyn so much. That's limited to megabytes. So in, in Germany, we have it, oh, it goes by hours or even by downloads. So Captivate has like you can even upload WAV files, and that's oh, a cool thing to have. Captivate. That's who you Captivate. use for your hosting. Fan. Yeah. Some of my clients use Captivate. Or others use Podigy, which is a German provider. And that's that's it. So Libsyn is really cool. It has a lot of features, but it's limited to this megabyte thing, which is, I don't know, they should change it. Right. 
maybe if they listen to this episode, they might consider changing. Uh, yeah, I have a feeling. Uh, well, first of all, I don't think they're listening. And se- well, they might be. But second of all, no, they're not going to change that. Okay. So it's their business model just to buy no? people buying the megabytes. Yeah, I mean, that's how they have it set up. And that's, that's yeah, it's their business model. So I don't think they would change it. I mean, what Captivate's doing, if if Captivate is just basically charging you for the... Downloads? Yeah. The length of the audio file, like if it's an hour-long file, they don't care whether it's a wave or an MP3 or whatever, right? In Captivate, they actually charge you by the downloads. So you have 10,000 downloads a month it equals $19. Oh, okay. Well, no, but that's... But Libsyn... Okay, so that that seems fair. And Libsyn also does something like that, although they don't promote it a lot. Like, I mean, if you are if you have Libsyn... Like, I, I've used Libsyn for many, many years. Hmm. And... I, you know, I don't get that many downloads, right? I don't definitely don't get ten thousand. Uh, no, what, um, per month? month. Yeah, I don't think so. No way. No. no? Okay. I think so I'm I averaging in the US. A per yes. episode. I might as well divulge my stats live here. All right, everybody, listen. <laughs> <laughs> I know you all want to know this. All right. No, I think for for this show, I. It's somewhere around a thousand downloads per episode in the first four weeks, which apparently that's it's okay. Way above average, uh, and I'm happy with it. I'm I'm just happy with everything. I don't anyway. Yeah. But my point is with Libsyn, if I if I did start to get like Joe Rogan numbers and start to oh. get up, you know, five hundred thousand downloads and all that, then they come in and they will start charging you a lot more. So definitely. So that's when you change the host, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Although Dan Carlin with Hardcore History, he uses Libsyn and he gets, that guy gets, Rob Walsh told me once that he's the only podcaster, I don't know if he's, well, definitely on Libsyn, maybe in the world, when he puts out an episode, in the first 24 hours, he gets more than a million downloads. Wow, that's huge. And it's like, what? whoa, man, <laughs> that's so cool. Yeah. He deserves that's it. That's really cool. <laughs> all right. So then, um, all right. So that's, I guess that's your speed round. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> some people, some people go long. All right. All so right. we have okay. a lot to talk about because you sent me uh, in, in the little questionnaire I gave you, you sent me a oh, lot, okay. uh, many different plugins, which we will talk about. But okay. So you're talking into the SM7B. Great mic. Yes. By the way, one thing about the SM7B is I think Bandrew Scott from Podcastage, he likes my voice on the SM7B better than better the than R20. my voice sounds right now on this RE20. Um, but here's the thing. I don't know. I don't think there's anything wrong with my SM7B, but when I record my voice on the SM7B, it just sounds a little bit dull or muddy. And I'm thinking maybe that's because I get too close to it. Um, it is complicated to handle. So it, yeah, it needs a lot of processing though, but I use it because it's a standard thing. Um, uh, people, when they come to the studio to record, they like to see it. It gives them a reference. Um, so I, my good friend from Slate Digital, Stephen Slate, you know, the plugins. Oh yeah. You're friends with him? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. And uh, if I have a chance... I use the ML1, like the big diaphragm microphone to record podcasts. But you have to have like a really good speaker who knows how to handle like a big diaphragm microphone. Okay. Otherwise, they spit into it or shot into it and it's oh. it's complicated. But I also like um, on the go, to make it a little more time consuming, the, the equipment, um, I have actually a Yellowtech IXM. You know them? I've heard of the Yellowtech. So t- t- yeah, tell me about that one. Yeah. So it's it's by far it's it's a super I would say idiot proof microphone. You can shout in, you can do anything kind of noises in very noisy environments. It's gonna record it and it sounds gonna like a radio production oh. if you put it off. So it has um, different uh, exchangeable mic capsules, which is really cool. Right, and different let's, patterns. Different yeah. patterns, right? So let's just yeah. be clear. This is a let's so so the audience can a standalone. Yeah, can know it's it's a it's a handheld microphone yeah that like, records straight into sd card right like a it's like a it's like in the shape of a regular handheld mic microphone. like a sm58 yes. 
Yes, it's a little bit bigger. It, it also has an included battery, plus you can put in some extra batteries. And you record on an SD card, and it has an included dynamic limiter. So you cannot clip the audio. Well, yeah. Life so saver. Yeah. So I've really looked at unique. this mic like 10 times, by the way, like online. And then they were at Podcast Movement. They had a booth. And I walked over, and I'm just looking at this mic. It's so cool because it records... The SD card goes in the mic itself, and the processing is in the... Everything's in the mic. It's totally... You, you don't need anything else. You just hold the mic and hit record on the mic, and then you can walk around and record really good audio, right? Yeah. No touching noises. So when you grip the microphone, like when you use like a Zoom handheld recorder, yeah. you can have those noises rattling. It, it has like a floating capsule of the microphone, so it's not connected to the outer... Where you touch actually the microphone, it's disconnected. So even the buttons have like a plastic protection. So there are no clicking noises going into the microphone. And it's German engineering, you know? Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, no, no really handling cool. yeah. noise. And like, I, yeah, I'm going to have to get one of those. But they are, I think, expensive. Yeah. They're expensive. They're really, I was lucky. I, I had an eye on those for like a year or so. Then on, there's like a, uh, a Spanish website where people you sell their used gear. Like, what do you have in the States? Oh, like uh, eBay and stuff? Yeah, eBay, eBay and stuff. So I saw one and they, like a secondhand shop, and they purchased like the whole inventory of a media producing company. And they had one for 199 euros. Ooh. And it costs, like, if you buy it new, it's 1,100, like 1,200 euros, which is like $1,400 maybe. Right. And I, I called them and I asked them, like, hey, do you still have those this microphone? Yeah, we don't sell it. But yeah, okay. Yeah, I take it. Yeah. And so they <laughs> sent me. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, I take that. So they sent me the microphone for, I paid 200 euros for. Yeah, it was my lottery win, I guess. That's really cool. I always want to get. I I always want to buy one of those and use that when I go on location and stuff. In fact, you know what? Maybe I should get one of those to like when I go to Podfest and stuff. Yeah, and podcast movement. It's really noisy environments. It's it's the perfect thing to you know because the people who come up to our booth. I'm gonna have a booth for podcast engineering school, and I like when people walk up to say hello. I always want. I always wish I could record, Snippets. like like ha have them do like a twenty second promotion of like give their name and give their the name of their podcast and give their website, and just record yeah. it for like yeah. an episode I can put together later. And um, sure, but this perfect mic, solution. this Yellow Tech mic, would be perfect yeah. for that. It is perfect. I mean, it's really, really. A game change and a lifesaver, in co especially in complicated situations. So it's really, really good. Yeah. No post-processing needed. Like you do not have to do any noise reduction whatsoever. So you're listening to the background noise, but it's really focused on, on the vocal, on, right. on the speech. Yeah. yeah, all right. So see, you're talking. I'm going to have to get that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez. I'll pay full price, of course. But I like paying. Well, Oh, you can talk to them. They have a podcast mic coming out, and maybe if you talk to them, they give you. They usually give in Germany like fifteen fifteen percent discount if you're a professional. All right. Plus, I'm going to be using it and talking about it. Hmm. Yeah. So it's for free, maybe. Ah, uh, I don't like taking stuff for free though. But I mean, I I have a few times, but I usually don't yeah. like that. But all right, cool. So let's. Uh, okay. So you got the SM7B into a Fed head. So the Fed head. Yeah. I've never owned a Fed head, but. I've I've been told by people that that is one of the best uh, the mic gain boosters around. Do you yeah. think that's true? I had the Cloud Lifter too, and it's just more practical because it's just an XLR plug, and you plug it between your cable and the microphone right in. It's not any kind of case or box like the Cloud Lifter, mm -hmm. and it's super practical. And I think it's half price of what the Cloud Lifter is. So it's sixty sixty dollars, and the cloud lifter is like one hundred and twenty something. Uh. It does this. It's just a mic boost. So now Behringer is coming out with like twenty five dollar, um, like cloud lifters or oh. whatever. With it, yeah, Clark Technic they announced them, and maybe those are good as well. I'm gonna buy them just to try it out. Then, but I think yeah, the show definitely needs some kind of extra gain to make it sound fairly decent. Otherwise, you have to crank really, really your gain knob on your interface or yeah. 
your DBX, and it's going to introduce a lot of noise, I guess. Right. Yeah, so the SM7B, really good if it has a mic booster like that. Uh, although, Same. I just watched uh, Bandrew's latest video on the SSL2+, Plus, which is their yeah. new little audio interface. And by the way, if you're listening to this and you haven't seen Bandrew's video on that, go check it out. It's really cool. Anyway, SSL made a little... It's like $280 interface with a couple mic inputs. and uh, But the gain on the preamps, I think there's 65 dB of gain. So mm -hmm. that that's enough where you could plug an SM7B into that SSL2 Plus and you do not need a Fethead. Although if you had one, that would it would still help, but you don't like need it. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. What I encountered when not using the fan head and just cranking the gain was um, the noise introduction right. by the interface. So that's something to consider. Yeah. You have to try. Yeah, that's it. You got to try it and t test it a little. So so you plug your mic into your uh, Universal Audio Apollo Twin interface. Yeah. And so I've always, well, I've always wanted to own some Universal Audio interfaces uh, but uh, how's the how is the how are the mic preamps and the amount of gain on on the Apollo Twin? Well, you have like a wheel and you just crank the gain, and basically that's it. So the cool thing about the Universal Audio thing is that you have the unison preamps or the unison effects, which change like the actual impedance of the input to make it as similar as it can get to the real deal. Right. Um, so you have your 1073 or your API or Universal Audio 610 em emulations. <clears throat> and they sound really, really good, though. Um, it is a fancy... It, it's no must-have, but it's a nice extra to have. Right. And just for everyone who's not familiar with those uh, Universal Audio interfaces, um, the, the preamps themselves, they can actually model old classic gear. So you can... It, like the preamp on the Apollo Twin, it's not just a plain old preamp. It's a preamp that can model different uh, amazing analog gear. And so you choose. Do you want it to model a Neve 1073 preamp and have that sound or a the 610? API, yeah. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he actually, yeah, it's not for preamps only, but for key times and, and a couple of other stuff. Right. And of course, they have really great plugins as well. Yeah. Um, EQ's a expensive, yeah, um, but it's really cool, really good stuff, yeah. All right, so now let's talk about the SSL six because I saw this at NAB last year and I was like, I just thought it was so cool. It's like a little mini SSL mixer. I think it's well, there's I think there's two mic inputs or four. You have two mic inputs, yeah, and you have like the talkbed mic you can use as a mic input as well. Right, so it's like it it's sort of like an interface, but I think it costs about fifteen hundred bucks, was it? It is fairly expensive. Well, for an SSL, it's not expensive. So yeah. it is... But it also has the thing. SSL EQs in the mix. It has the EQs, but it's a two-band EQ. So oh. high shelf and... Yeah. But it's it's enough. So it, it makes it shiny. It makes it... So the preamps by themselves, if you would buy them standalone, it, it's like $800 per preamp um, just by itself. And you have the bus compressor. It has fixed threshold let me just check sure yeah the bus compressor it has a it has a fixed ratio so the makeup okay. gain and the threshold can be adapted but it, uh, it is a fixed ratio okay. which for me is cool because i all even though if i would use the ssl compressor as a plug-in it, it would be always on the same uh preset yeah. and i just hit the fader so it enters the ssl as i want it to be so i would never actually had a clone a couple years back I never changed the the knobs at all, so it's and it sounds fantastic. Yeah, that's cool. Hmm. It's big too, and it's by the way, even though it's two mic inputs, it's not like a little audio interface. This thing is like probably eighteen inches wide by eighteen, you know, maybe eighteen inches square. It's it's pretty big. <laughs> it is decent sized, but it's still. I would say portable. I wouldn't take it to a to a podcasting gig because I would be scared that people steal the oh. SSL just oh, if they see the logo. Right. Oh, but okay. I have it at home. I use it for for pod, pod, podcasting, not so much, but for tracking if I do music jingles or compositions or 
uh, use it as a master bus processor. If I do audiobooks and stuff, it, it makes them sound really fancy and gives a little this this gluey thing um and and if i tell my customers that i use output gear or analog gear it just gives an extra more um value so i right. think oh that's a really cool oh it sounds so analog to me and i say yeah <laughs> that's because of yeah 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 and and so i what when i saw the ssl6 i thought it would be really good for like either live streaming or like recording an interview and the mute, like recording a show live, like yeah. like in the old days, uh, Cliff Ravenscraft used to teach where you 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 basically, you know, you have your interview and you play your music, you do everything live and you mix it down to two tracks live, and then that's it. That's yeah. your mix. That's your episode. You're done. You know, just change yeah. it into an MP3 or convert it to an MP3 and upload it. Um, but that's one thing the SSL six would be good for because it has the stereo compressor, the bus compressor, and yeah. so you could sit there with two people in a room having a conversation. You could bring in some music to the mixer as well, yes. And then you could use the bus compressor to make it to boost it and make it tighter and louder, and then that could go right out to a live stream. I thought that would be a yeah. pretty cool use of it. Yeah, definitely, that would improve the sound a lot. So, right. yeah, and even three people, so you have to talk with Mike, so you can uh, use. That mic is an additional input as well. Right, but so for the talkback mic, you can that's an, an an extra input, but of course it does not have any EQ or anything associated no. with it. Yeah, it's yeah. just talkback. Yeah. Just the just the mic input, which hmm. again, if you need it, it, again it's there if you need it. Um, yeah. Okay, it's um, a nice extra to have. I, I think for the price um, and the features that it has, it's it's a very unique approach and it's very high quality and it's definitely. Worth it to take a look at it, yeah, or to try it at your local store. Um, right. The sound is fantastic. So, mm. hmm. Okay, um, any other microphones? I didn't ask you if you owned any others. So I have, uh, obviously I have the Zoom H5 as well, if I need to on a go. Okay. I have the pod mic um, from Rode. Then I have the Slate ML2s, which are the tiny, tiny dynamic microphones that they use for instrumental recording, which in some cases I can use for podcasting as well. What 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 were those mics again? Slate ML2s. Okay. ML2. And uh, a bunch of 58s that I use all the time. So the Shure SM7s, I have four of those. So. Oh, okay. Wow. People just with the so with the PSA ones, the road mic stand, and people just laugh at how it looks on the tail when you do the setup and locations. Uh. <clears throat> and I also use the Roadcaster Pro. Okay. When I go on on mobile recordings, um, people like it because it has a lot of knobs and lights and faders. And <laughs> it's, it's uh. It is. It makes a it gives a professional impression to the to the client. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a it for for a consumer mindset. It uh, for a person with a consumer mindset, it does look like you know a, a, an intricate piece of audio yeah. gear that looks really cool. Yeah. yeah, it gives you more value as a um, as a producer or somebody who goes out and if even if you charge like in a budget and you show up with your equipment, oh okay, it's high value. So it's right. So it's all about perception. It's like when you walk with your iPhone uh, and stuff. Um, it gives the people that you do business with, they think that you're higher or more professional person when you, even though it's not necessary, it's just marketing, I guess. So, right. But it's, yeah. Makes sense. So I want to ask you about the Rodecaster Pro and the Rode Pod Mic because those are, those have been out in the world. A, a little over a year now. So, what are your yeah. what are your opinions about that? About the sound of, of of the Rodecaster Pro and the Pod Mic, or you know how professional it is. What what can you say about it? Well, the Rodecaster, it is a one and all solution. Um, I think really made for the pros. It is not. It's for a little. I think because you do not have any features, you cannot change the compressor features or the noise gate or the threshold and stuff. Um, if you record. With the processing on, if you do the processing, it's going to do a lot of processing. So it's it's going to sound really processed. Um, so that's why I always record clean. I don't use the uh, excitements or audio exciters that they have included. 
but it's very practical. And uh, a thing that I would love to see is to use it <clears throat> with the SD card recording multi-track and have a USB audio interface to do live stream at the same time. So to have both options, but it's not available currently. Oh, so wait, you would want to record multi-track on the unit. Like you can do that yeah. now. And but yeah. in addition to that, you would want like a stereo mix going out another stereo output. Yeah. Okay. If you do live streaming and stuff, and Got then it. if you would love to process it as a, you can do it on the computer. You can put the computer to run and to record it on the computer. But maybe in some locations, I don't know. It's not possible. It would be a nice feature to have. But wait, and on the Rodecast. Sorry, on the Rodecaster Pro, do, does it not have a just a stereo output on the back? It has a stereo output, yeah. But I would love to record multi-track on the SD card and to have like the feature of uh, of stereo out. Yeah, you, right now you're making me question if it works <laughs> or not. So. Yeah, but I want to use the the USB as a USB audio interface to do it. If I would go, not to go stereo out into another audio interface and then to do <clears throat> the live streaming. Got it. Doesn't got make it. sense. Yeah, yeah. So you want stereo to go to the computer. Yeah. And then go, yes. that, and you could send that out somewhere. Yeah. So yes. I guess in order to do that, though, you'd, if you're bringing it in multi track, you'd have to open a DAW, bring in all the tracks, and then somehow take the mix from the DAW and send it to a live stream, which I don't know. I, Unless you're on a Mac, that might be. You can. I think you can use like what's what's it called, Soundflower. Okay. Where you can create like a virtual sound card and. Right. Yeah, I use uh, Audio Hijack and and Loopback yeah. from Rogue Amoeba, For and example. those are. Yeah. You can do anything on a Mac. I, what I just did. Yeah, I would love to tell what I did yesterday. I'm gonna. Um, I am going to do that. Um, by the way, I started streaming on Twitch, so cool. that's where I'm going to cover that but i i made all oh it's so cool what i did um anyway i'll reveal it soon because i actually have to test it again to, nice. to verify my my experiment you know before i divulge <laughs> nice um and yeah the pot mic um it is cool it is cheap it's for me it doesn't sound like the sm7 as they say it's the sm7b killer it doesn't sound it sounds thin on the lower end um it's fairly heavy, which people say is a good thing. Uh, if I go on transportation stuff, it's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah. If you take it on a plane and stuff, they look at you like you're carrying grenades or weaponry. Um, yeah. But for a hundred dollars, you really can't complain for what it is. So it, it, it looks cool and it does what it does. So and right. it does the job well. Yeah. Yeah. The that pod mic, it seems to have. Uh, uh, ridden the wave of of hype and excitement when the Roadcaster Pro came out and ooh a new mic and like it just all of a sudden everyone was saying that the mic is really good and but every pretty much everyone I talked to who who really knows audio they're not impressed by the pod mic I mean it's okay no. but it's okay it does the job yeah it's cool exactly. and it's just but I so for me the the regular Shure SM58 sounds much better than the pod mic, and it's almost the same price range. That's exactly what. Uh, <laughs> well, someone I won't name them. Someone told me they said it's 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 okay, but it's not even as good as a 58. That's what they said to me. <laughs> yeah. So the 58 sounds really cool. I mean, even the 57, you can EQ it in post, and it sounds super cool. Mm. Um, yeah. And the pop filter that they say is included, I don't know if it does the desired effect. So you have to put like a foam on top or another pop filter, depending on the person who's speaking into a microphone. Yeah, that all these mics do that. The Even the RE20, they say yeah. they're, they're technically there's a pop filter inside it. There's a little foam. Yeah. It does it, it does help a little bit, but you still need more protection from plosives. And totally. I, it, it's always weird when microphones say that. They're like, oh, and there's a pop filter included within the mic. So there's no need for an external pop filter. It's like, yeah. no, you people don't get it. <laughs> like, yeah, maybe for some it's not necessary, but for a lot of people, yeah, you need a pop filter, definitely. So yeah. even now, if I would speak 
right into the SM7, it would pop like a lot. Um, so I speak on the side. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit prevent the sharp German S sounds from not <laughs> diving too much into the microphone. But <clears throat> it really depends on the person who's speaking into the mic. Right. So, yeah. All right, let's move on to Studio One because I cannot recall if I've had a past guest on this show who uses Studio One as their DAW. Cool. You may be the first. Yeah, congratulations to so, me. Yeah, so nice. thank you. And so, <laughs> all right, so apparently you like it because you use it, but um, so tell me your experience with Studio One. Well, I come from Pro Tools, uh, but I've used Studio One ever since they came out with 1.5. So it's like almost 10 years now. And uh, I just love the workflow. It is so easy. It has also the function that I used in Pro Tools. Plus there's this feature with the plugins to have drag and drop. You just drag and drop the plugins mm. on the track and you can save the channel presets. Um, you just click and you have profiles. So with all the podcasts that I have uh, with my clients, I have a channel preset pre-established. Just Click, load, smart EQ, smart comp, mm, bounce, and 10 minute the episode is off. So it goes really fast. So it's, I'm sure you can do it with any DAW, but I'm just so used to the workflow. And you have ARA, ARA integration, you know, like Melodyne and Revoice. Uh, you can integrate it like natively, so it opens up a window in your real-time processing. So you do not have to analyze anything and then record it to another track, which what you have to do with when you use like Melodyne in Pro Tools. You record the snippet, you open it up, you edit it, and you print it to another audio track. Okay. And just for the folks who don't know what Melodyne is in general, please explain that. Melodyne is a, a pitch shifting tool that you would use so you can uh, transform your voice and you can edit it like it would be a midi track okay so you can you can create harmonies and and a lot of more stuff that i don't use right but, and mostly for music yeah. yeah yes although i do for my um uh, my assistant who uh who he hasn't showed up in a while he's from another planet actually okay. and uh for his voice, I use uh, I use like a robotic effect. <laughs> but anyway, so that's like the only time and you would ever use any effect like that in podcasting is if you want to yeah. do something weird or funny. Well, there's this new Waves plugin, which is really cool. Which one? What's it called? The, the, the B-Vox, R-Vox, the vocoder thing. Oh, I didn't hear it. Let me check just a second. Okay. It was actually on sale, so I bought it. It's really cool. It has super cool presets. Ovox. Ovox. And that's Ovox. like different vocal effects. It is super cool. Oh, cool. Creative plugin. Okay. Well, okay. So, Studio One, you like, we got to, I, I really want to talk about some of these uh, plugins you're using because. Sure. Uh, so, Studio One. Um, okay. And when you mix out of Studio One, do you mix your episodes directly to MP3 or do you mix it to a WAV file for archiving purposes and then create an MP3 from that? It depends on the client. Um, usually I don't do archiving. I save all the sessions, I save all the files, and I do a hard drive wipe every 90 days. So I have it on okay. autopilot and it deletes files that are older than three months without uh, having been opened in, in, in 90 days. Okay. And so... Your, all those files for the clients that are getting deleted after 90 days, do you have some sort of backup of all that or no? It's all backed up. So I have 28 terabyte Lacey, Oof. a 16 terabyte backup, and I have Dropbox for Business. <laughs> Six terabytes. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah, you got the backups covered. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. I think as I work with collaborators for editing, um, we use Dropbox and I have the shared folder in Dropbox for the client and they have another shared folder um, for editing, which includes the Studio One session. So oh, cool. with all the files included. So we open up and everyone can work remotely and you just save it and it saves it to Dropbox. Cool. And then, yeah, if you ever, ha if you ever do have to make a change to an episode, you just bring up the session again, make the change yeah. and re-render it. Yeah. Cool. All right, so you're using RX7 Advanced. I mean, that's a tool that I don't I I literally don't know how I could continue producing podcasts 
at the level yes. I'm producing them without RX-7 Advanced. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a lifesaver. Mm. Hmm. And you use a denoise, the mouth declick. Mouth declick is so handy. Yeah. Um, okay, but let's... We might come back to RX, but let's talk about Soothe 2 real quick. And then what I really want to talk about is the Sonable, the Smart EQ, and the Smart Compressor. But let's start with Soothe 2. I've owned Soothe for a couple years, and they just upgraded it to Soothe 2. And I just love this plugin. So how, how do it's you use it? What do you use it for? I just load it up with the preset and just change the amount. Yeah. Oh, okay. It you just use the presets. Mm, less invasive than version one. So it, uh, it sounds much smoother to me, the first version of right. the plugin. Uh, the effect is not so noticeable as it would be in the first version. So it's really, really much better for me in the sound here. Yeah. And so people understand what Soothe 2 does. What what are you using it for specifically? For de sing and resonant frequencies. Yeah, de sing and resonant frequencies. Cool. Like the yeah, the 4K stuff, harshness and 2K maybe. And if it's muddy in the 200, 400 region, dip it out there. Yeah, yeah. you know what? That's one thing I did not do with version one is I never really tried to to uh use it on like the low mids but the first version didn't go all the way down to 20 hertz by the way it i forget no. where it stopped but it wasn't but now soothe 2 does go all the way down yeah so now i'm going to try it in the low mids what do you, what do you um is it just when like maybe a voice sounds muddy or something that you use it in the low mids or lows I just take the knob and I drag it all the way down and I see and I, and I listen how it sounds. Otherwise, I just drag it back up okay. um, and it goes really fast. So within like 15 seconds, I know if it's needed or not. So That is cool. Yeah, you just bring bring down the lower end uh, cutoff frequency and then you can, yeah. you can hear what it's doing. You can also see on the screen. That's one of the coolest yes. things about Soothe is the, yeah. the UI. You can, you can see where it's dipping frequencies, right? Hmm. I think it's super practical and it's saving you so much time. Yeah, definitely. So cool. All right, now the Sonable plugins, I, I've i never even tried them. I've seen a few videos on YouTube about the Smart EQ and the Smart Compressor. Um, can you just tell me about them? Like, start from the beginning. Well, I don't know anything, so treat me as if I know nothing. Tell me about them. Okay, so Sonable is an Austrian company. And uh, Sonable Smart EQ is basically you have uh, an audio track, instrument voice. You have to say, you have to tell Sonable what kind of the Smart EQ, what kind of audio it is. So if you go speech and you click on analyze and you press play and it analyzes the voice and it creates an EQ curve specifically for that voice. And you can open the bands so it so it covers the, the aspect of the 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 hertz that you, the range that you want to have the effect on, and you have a percentage of the actual effect, like a, like a mix knob. Got it. And that's that's basically it, yeah. And it goes super fast, so it listens to it for like twenty seconds. And then you have a pro tile profile. Just I usually go like fifty percent or forty percent of wow. the sound, and it's perfect. So you have like really muddy recordings from clients sometimes, um, and that's like really lifesaver. Right, so it scans the audio, comes up with a curve that it thinks is good, and what you're doing yes. is you're only using 40 or 50% of that effect that they're yes. suggesting. Yeah. And all, But also, you can change anything you want. Like, you can drag yes. frequencies and, yeah. Yeah, you can use it as a regular EQ afterwards, yeah. Right. So just the, the idea of getting a starting point from the artificial Definitely. intelligence. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. If you want to use it as, as like a reference, yeah, like a mix aid, and it works. But it's like for music, it's fabulous too, yeah. It does a really good job. Yeah. See, I'm going to have to try this one. You have to buy it. One. Yeah. You know, it's really cheap. It's cheap? I think it's $69 or something. So it's not really expensive. Oh, yeah. Wow. All right. And, mm. and so I'm wondering if the FabFilter Pro Q3, I know it doesn't do that exact thing. Hmm. But anyway, but anyway, the reason I brought up the Pro Q3 is that I think there's a lot of there. There are many features of Pro Q3 which I don't use, 
Like there's EQ yeah, match. There's like auto. Yeah. I, I don't even know what there is. I have to look into that more because that's also a good EQ. EQ match is a good thing for Prokofi. If you have like really bad voice um, and you have a voice profile that sounds really good, like it's your Rogan podcast, and you take the curve and you match it over the really bad sounding one and it helps you with the EQ process really quickly. So it's time saver too. Right. Yeah, the thing with the EQ match, the thing I'm always afraid of, and I haven't done much of it at all. Um, I, I know I've done it a couple times. I think in RX, I think in RX you can also do, hmm. you can take an EQ profile and then apply that profile to another piece of audio. Yes. One thing I'm always worried about, though, is like, and and maybe the machine learning and the AI has taken all this into consideration, but like different people's voices on different mics, they're going to... Sh- the, the frequency response is going to be very different. So yes. just because, let, let's say high frequencies, like 10K and above. Okay, if I record on a darker microphone, yeah, there's going to be less 10K and above. So, But then if I apply another EQ profile that boosts up 10K, it might actually sound worse because it's, oh, it's yeah. too artificial or something. You have to try, yeah, you have to try. Yeah, so you, you, you can use it, but then you always got to listen. and Sure, yeah, listen always, yeah. It's yeah. not like you put it on and <clears throat> you have to, I always double check. So, so I, now I want to ask you about the smart compressor because I've actually never even seen videos on this. So, so explain the, the Sonable smart compressor to me. It is the same feature as the smart EQ. Okay. You uh, select your track profile. Uh, for instance, it has male voice or female voice press the record button, it learns the profile and it creates a compression setting that you can use and it even has like a fine tuning mode which makes it a little less uh, dominant the effect and you have your mix knob as well. But it's to really get smooth and out everything um, don't expect it to be like wow amazing 1176 kind of slamming uh, effect It's it's very subtle so it's really cool. Okay, and it, I'm assuming it's multiband. It is multiband, yeah. Okay, cool, yeah. So it has like um, it is it has a regular one, and then the advanced stuff is like a thousand bands or something. I I don't know if it's a thousand bands, but it's like a lot of bands, yeah. Wow. It w- so wait, w- would it show all those bands on the screen? No, no, you can't actually um, touch those bands. But let me just. Oh, I see. So it'll it'll okay. It has like a smart feature, like like something that makes it more, how would I say, refined. Um, Got it. I, I don't touch it, so I use it just a regular compression setting. Got it. And that's fine for me. Uh, and then I put like the VSC2, which is very transparent. And there's a preset also called spoken word or something. And you just, I just move the threshold and adjust the makeup gain. Okay. And it sounds really good. Like if you would use the 1176 DLA blue present preset that everyone use it for for rock music, mm-hmm. same thing. And it makes it very radio sounding, super cool. Oh, cool. So that you were meant you were saying the Brainworks VSC2 compressor. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay, cool. See, I I just said okay, cool, and now my phone perked up. It it thought I said okay. I, I'm not gonna say. Oh, you it. have voice commands? No, it um phone? Google. Oh, cool. If I say okay, nice. Google, see, it just came on. But sometimes when I say okay, cool, okay, hmm. it recognizes it at Google as Google. yeah. It thinks I said <laughs> that, and then it, my phone perks up, and it's like um I'm recording an episode. <laughs> All right, so the Brainworks compressor you like as well and then the the fab filter pro l2 which yes this is one that i've been getting into recently you like the pro mm-hmm. l2 i've used it all the time so i used the, the version one and <clears throat> it's just uh, like a safeguard so i actually don't use the features like with the upsampling or whatever i just put like minus 14 loves and i just pull up the gain 
and I don't change any any features. So it's if it's transparent limiting or if it's what it has brick wall or vintage, I don't change anything. I just use the regular preset setting. Right. Sounds quite boring, right? So you no, <laughs> well, so but so it's a great limiter. And here's but here's the thing. So you said you bring it up to minus fourteen luffs. Yes. So how do you use the Pro L two? Do you use the Pro L two to set the final loudness of your entire episode? Yeah. Okay, so how do you do that in there? Just raising the gain on the left side. There's a gain line, and you just go up until it reaches the... So you can actually put, like, um, uh, visual feedback. You can tell him if you want to have it, like, minus 14 loves, minus 9. And oh, you set the target. The target, and shows it your target, and then you just pull up the, the makeup gain. And then, and then on the meter, you can see the meter against see, yeah. the target, yes. and you just try to line yes. it up? Yeah. Okay. If I have uh, clients that are very dynamic speaking, I often use um, vocal writer, like in oh. early stage. So that's set and forget as well. So. Right. So okay, yeah. the vocal writer. So you're you're using the vocal writer uh, with your compression and EQ in the mix. Sometimes, yeah. Not always. Okay. Yeah. So then the Pro L2, are you are you using the limiter like on the master bus of your mix or something? I use it on the individual tracks. Oh, okay. So if I have an interview, so each <clears throat> each track is maximized, maxed out, so it goes into the master bus. Um, and I put an L2 also on the master bus just in case. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's perfect all the time. Oh, that's cool. So you use the, the Pro L2 on each individual voice. Mm -hmm. and set the luffs level to that level. Yeah. So you're setting, are you really setting individual voices to minus 14 luffs? Is that the exact number? Minus 14 to minus 16, sometimes to minus 18. So there's okay. a range. No, it's not always at the same. So okay. there's obviously some dynamics in the voice when people speak, but it's within this range. So it I can see. be at minus 21 if a person talks really quiet for two seconds or so. I so see. it's not always loud. Got it. Got yeah. it right. So the the dynamics of the speaker, the meter will change. So what you're trying yeah. to what do you, maybe maybe when they talk really loud, you you maybe want it to hit minus fourteen, but yes. maybe on average minus sixteen or eighteen or something. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And of course, you're listening to what the limiter does. Because by the way, a limiter, if you crush something with a limiter, it does it does weird things to the sound, man. I, it's yeah. hard to explain, right? <laughs> It creates a lot of artifacts, um, especially if you use MP3 files. Or it sounds kind of distorted, very weird. So it's not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. And even just as far as the dynamics go, like when someone says something loud, you expect it to be loud. But if you're using too much of a limiter, they'll it say something it loud, yeah. but it won't be loud. And it'll be, it'll just seem, it's, it's weird. It's like your, your yeah. brain knows, oh, that's, something's wrong. That's not natural. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's definitely something that you have to consider, especially for interviews, yeah. If, if there's laughing or if there's, I don't know, interaction, um, you have to maintain a certain, how to say, it should be a natural conversation. It should sound right. like a natural conversation. Natural dynamics, yeah. 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 Yes. That, and that, see, that to me, that's the trick as an engineer, to keep the natural dynamics enough, keep enough of the natural dynamics, but also use... Also use compression and also make the the lower parts more audible. You can do all those things. And to me, that's what makes it sound good, which means it sounds yep. natural. It's nice and loud. You can hear everything they're saying, even when they're when even when they, you know, start to talk a little bit lower. Yes. <laughs> Barry, do you use um the Pro L2 ever? No way. R you don't? Really? Come on, Barry. You must use the Pro L2, right? You do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See, I knew you did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Vocal Rider, you, you, you mentioned that you do a, a set it and forget it on the Vocal Rider. So what, what kind of, how do you uh, adjust the settings in Vocal Rider? Um, the, there's a button which is called like fast, fast slide or fast movements. Right. So I put it on the fast one. Uh -huh. I open the... <clears throat> uh, the L2, the, the Pro L2, and uh, I just, 
how would you how would you say uh, slide up the the lower tiny fader that it has right so it i get into this minus 20 range so it stays at this range and then i keep processing it further so i have a, like a consistent level so it goes into the eq and then it goes into the compression oh so the vocal rider is like first in the chain yeah Okay. So as it is not working as a compressor, it's just a manual as if somebody would write a fader. So there's no compression effect um, at all. So just to get a consistent level. You can use, a lot of people use like Ophonic if you have the app. Right. But I don't like it too much. But I'd rather use the, the vocal writer. Right. Yeah, I, I feel the same way, actually. Hmm. Alphonic is really good, but I don't know why. And this is no knock on Alphonic, but a lot of times I'll, it, I, and I don't really, I haven't done it in a while, but when I would upload a track to sort of even out the dynamics and stuff, it just it would, the file would come back. And even though it was still a wave file, it just, I don't know, it didn't sound as clear or something. If you buy the desktop version, the application, it has a lot more options. And the quality is different too. Mm. So if you're very busy and have extensive workload or if you record congresses or big events um, and you have like a really fast turnover and the recording quality is really bad, I run it through a phonic and then I process it further. So I just when I import it into the door, I have a consistent level and I can start working with that one. Right. And if you use Rx uh, advanced stuff, if you have like a consistent loud noise profile, it's much easier to process it out or right. just to eliminate the, the background noise. That's what I found from when I used it. So Right. Yeah. All right. Well, so then you're going to, you, you use all that uh, processing and then you mix it down to a 320 kilobits per second Kip. MP3. And yes. is that, is that, do you normally mix to mono or stereo? I keep it as it is stereo, so cool. Yeah, yeah, because mu there's usually music involved, <clears throat> and yeah, yeah. Um, can happen then if people use like the Zoom H5 or H4 and it records in stereo. Um, you have to convert those tracks in mono. Or I use the what's it called um, Brainworks V3 Digital EQ, which has like a mono button but it's depending on the frequency so you want to say like everything below 500 or 700 hertz is mono oh so i i pull it up to like 2k and if you pull it up all the way mono it sounds very muddy um so i keep the upper frequencies in stereo and i put the 2k into mono but you have to try a little bit until it sounds good for you but yeah, because if they talk into the microphone, maybe you have a little more on the left side, the voice, than in the middle, because they don't use it or they twist their head towards the other person and you have kind of weird effects. And right. Then you have to convert it into mono. But if you would do it like really in mono, it would sound really strange. Right. So that's why I do it frequency dependent. That is really cool. I've actually never uh, tried that. I, now I want to cool. try that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so basically like let's say you brought you, you can have you could for instance have everything from 1k and below in mono and oh, everything from 1k and above in stereo yeah yeah so cool that's it. yeah all right i i need to hear I, I need to figure out a way to record something and then mess with that maybe i'll do that on my on my twitch stream <laughs> yeah Be sure. a good thing to do Cool. All right, so then 320 kbps, and uh, how do you tag the MP3s? What software do you use to tag them? I think I have what everyone has is the ID3 tagger. Oh, the ID3 tagger. ID3 editor, yeah. which is like $10 or something. Um, I haven't seen any other tool that has all the features that this one has. Right. Do, I, do you? Yeah, yeah, that's the one I use for all yeah. my clients and everything. And But now for my show only... Because now I'm actually publishing my show in a M4A format. Uh -huh. um, I actually create my M4A using Fission from Rogue Amoeba. And within uh -huh. Fission, you can actually add the metadata. And so I tag it within Fission now. That's cool. just for my show. Yeah. 
Yeah. So Studio One has <clears throat> ID3 tagging also, but it's not as extensive as the ID3 editor. Right. Yeah, and that's the same thing with Fission. Uh, it's not as there's not as many tags as in the yes. ID3 editor. Yeah. Yeah. It's an extra step, but it's cool to have, and the clients really appreciate it if you export it with the. Yeah, and in the ID3 editor software, you can actually save uh, like a template. Yeah, so, you can load the the profile. Yeah, yeah, load, yeah. Use so a profile like, or, yeah. So I what I do is I fill out everything, but I leave out the episode name and I leave out the episode number. Yeah. Everything else you can put in, like the year, the genre, the no, everything else. And then, so then I save that as a template for ID3 editor. So then when I have a new episode with a client, I'll bring it into ID3 editor. I will load the template, which loads all the data. And then I just put in the title of the episode and the episode number and boom, done. An update. Yeah. And that's it. Super fast. It's really cool. Cool. So what, uh, we're, we're, uh, sort of getting toward the end here. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'd like to know what, what are the most valuable things you've learned over the past, whatever, four years producing podcasts? Whatever comes to mind. Whatever comes to mind. Um, having an established system, like Checklist. Uh, I work with Trello a lot. Oh. Especially um, all my clients, we use Trello. Um, I have a template that involves constantly, but if a new client comes in, uh, the onboarding process is really quickly, so I just create a copy of the board and send it to, to them. And for my fellow editors that work with me, I, we also use Trello and we use the Butler function very often. So everything that goes to deadline is automatically updated and copied to a workload uh, board that we have in Trello and everyone sees what has to be done and where's the deadline. Um, as said previously with the Dropbox thing, it is really cool having all the files, all the updates, um, all the backups in Dropbox makes it really handy, especially when I'm on the go and I can do changes with my laptop uh, while being in a hotel or in any place in the world. And LastPass, like saving all the passwords and oh. user accounts. Yeah. And uh, that is a really cool thing. And recently I got into the Stream Deck. Stream, you know Deck. stream Deck, Elgato Stream Deck. I've been hearing about these, and I, I, I know I want one. How are you using it? What are you doing? You can so you can open all the apps from within the Stream Deck. So you create the profiles, you click on it, it opens up the app. But I have a client profile that opens up the session, opens up the shared Dropbox folder, and opens up uh, the website with the login automatically for the client. Huh. So and you push one button, it loads the whole thing. Oh, man, that is cool. And just so everyone knows, it, and even for me, because I don't have one, a Stream Deck is just like a little piece of hardware with a bunch of different buttons on it, right? Yeah, it is buttons, but it has on each button an LCD screen, so it's uh, full color, and you can program anything, and you can use it even for live streaming or for Twitch or for OBS. It has like those streaming functions. You can switch cameras. You can, I don't know, record time. You can do a ton of stuff with it. Right. So, yeah. It's like but little I, short, the, shortcut keys for all different stuff. Yeah. yeah. And even combination, like follow-up actions. Like load up a session, import the file, blah, blah, blah. Um, you can do you really a lot, and it's fairly cheap. It's like $140 or so on, on Amazon. That's cool. So it's as far as time cool. management, do you find yourself like, like working on podcasts all the time or are you are you very clear in your life that okay i'm gonna work from nine to five and then i'm done with work i'm at this point i'm getting into time management so i use um harvest app get harvest um it has a chrome extension and even uh, a tiny app that you can install and have all my client profiles so even though i charge my clients by podcast not by hour of work but I track all the time that I spent with a client. So at the end of a month, I make a calculation to see if that client is worthy working with him or you have to do a raise or Got it. just to get an overview of, of the time spent. 
and uh, it gives you like an overview of your producti productivity. So even though maybe you have a client that pays a lot of money, but you spend half of your week dedicated to that client, so it's not so much money. Right. And you have the other ones that pay little fees, but you just spend 10 minutes on on a project, on a podcast. So, nice. and time-wise, I try to do... 80% podcast editing, 20% uh, podcast acquisition, uh, which I really want to change. So usually Thursdays and Fridays I dedicate to write emails uh, to get new prospects, uh, which is very important. So I at least try to get like three or four more clients per month on board it, which is really tough. But once you get into the, to the process, um, I have all the templates, I have all my prices, so I just have to change the name, I know the questions, and it's, it's getting like a more copy-paste, and you do the talk, and I do, <clears throat> I also try to do it in two calls, um, qualifying the prospect first, if he's really somebody I would want to work with. And in the second call, we go through all the details. And uh, in the second call, the client also has to decide if he wants to go with me or if he doesn't want to. So it's not like something that I would, yeah, I have to think about it. Like, I'm going to tell you in two weeks or three months. Um, right. So I'm just somebody who wants a decision in the second call. If not, it's totally okay. But I use HubSpot, you know, the CRM. Yep. I put all the customer details into the, the HubSpot thing and I put an alarm. So in three months, I will call them back. I do follow up. Got it. I like that you do that two meeting format because uh, I think a lot of podcast editors, they want like once they get someone on the phone, w once they get a potential client on the phone, the potential client inevitably asks the question, how much does it cost? And yeah. in the first meeting, you don't talk about cost at all, right? I would do the investment question, um, but it would. I would ask the, the prospect. I would ask him if I would offer you all this type of services. How much would that be for you, or how much would you be willing to spend for right. that type of results um, or for that type of services? Sounds like you're using a, a sales system. There sounds like uh... I. I try um, because I see it works from from other. Friends yeah. of mine, um, they're not in the podcast, but in like online marketing or like agencies, SMM, social media marketing. And I had actually a client that bought me a, a selling course because he told me that my selling uh, argument uh, was very poor. So I had to improve my sales game. Was it uh, Sandler? No, it's a German company. Oh, a German company. Well, they might but have learned I think from Sandler. Yeah, totally, totally copy okay. paste, I'm, I'm sure. But it works, um, and people, if you have like a, a, a script, in that case, for, for sales, um, it makes you appear more stable, more professional. Uh, you know what you have to ask for, you know what questions you have to ask for. Yep. And if the people ask you, eh, explain me or tell me, so you can tell them right away, this is just a qualification call. So we call each other and we try to figure out if it makes sense for both of us to, to work together. And if that's so, we're going to have another call where I go in detail about the process and how we're going to work together and right uh, when we can start, actually. Yep. So yeah, you, you that's to, really good. No, go ahead. Uh, you have to disqualify a lot of people, actually, even though <clears throat> if you're in the need of money, you take them. Uh, otherwise, you, if you say no gives you much more value so right yeah and just having one. having a system and a protocol actually just gives you more peace of mind or or you know like meaning you don't have to think too much when you're dealing with new potential clients because you have a system and this is the system we're going to walk through the system that's it yeah yeah so in the future also um as the business grows and i really want to onboard and have more team members so i need to have a standardized system so i can outsource the activities to to my further colleagues right cool all right well florian this has been unbelievable by the way are you in a place where you can yell quite loud for for a second or two oh sure 
Okay, all right. Because at the end of this end of the show, what we yell, we both we're both going to yell, "Sound great!" And I'll tell you when, but okay, not now. And and by the way, everyone listening, if you're driving in your car, if you're walking down the street, if you're in the supermarket shopping with your earbuds on, you're listening to me right now. (laughs) Everyone has to yell, "Sound great!" All right, let me start the music. Um, but Florian Shartner, thank you so much for coming on the Podcast Engineering Show, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate your time. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, you gave so many great insights. I really love this chat. And your the link to your site will be in the show notes. And uh, I'll try to find you on Twitter. Are you on Twitter? Not so much. Okay. Facebook, Instagram. But anyways, even though the website is in German, just get in touch with me over Facebook and everything. So okay. no problem. All right, now we got to yell. Ready? Go! Sound <laughs> Just